I was intimidated to see the size of the audience. Um, this is my biggest audience so far. But then... <laughs> I was intimidated, of course, but somebody graciously reminded me that all these people came out for you. So thank you so much for taking the time to, to come and hear me. It's such an honor uh, being read. So We Need New Names is set in a shanty town called Paradise. And uh, the people move there after they after their homes are bulldozed by the government. So I'm going to read a very short section that sort of speaks to how these people show up in paradise. The section is called How They Appeared. Um, okay. They did not come to paradise. Coming would mean that they were choosers, that they first looked at the sun sat down with crossed legs, picked their teeth and pondered the decision. That they had the time to gaze at their reflections in long mirrors, perhaps pet their hair, tighten their belts, check the watches on their wrists before looking at the red road and finally announcing, now we are ready for this. They did not come, no. They just appeared. They appeared one by one, two by two, three by three. They appeared single file, like ants, in swarms like flies, in angry waves like a wretched sea. They appeared in the early morning, in the afternoon, in the dead of night. They appeared with the dust from their crushed houses clinging to their hair and skin and clothes making them appear like things from another life. Swollen ankles and blisters under their feet, they appeared fatigued by the long walk. They appeared carrying sticks with which they marked the ground for where a shake would begin and end, and these they carefully passed around, partitioning the new land with hands shaking like they were killing something. Squatting to mark the ground like that, they appeared broken, shards of glass people. They appeared with tin, with cardboard, with plastic, with nails, and other things with which to build. And they tried to appear calm as they put up their shakes, nailing tin on tin, piece by piece, bravely looking up at the sky and trying to tell themselves and one another that even here, in this strange new place, the sky was still the same familiar blue, a sign things would work out for them. But far too many appeared without the things they should have appeared with. Woman, where is my grandfather's black stool? I don't see it here. What, are you crazy, old man? I don't even have enough of the children's clothes, and you are here talking about your dead grandfather's stool. You know it was meant to stay in the family. My greatest grandfather, Sindimba, passed it on to his son, Salile, who passed it on to his son, Galo, who passed it on to his son, Mapata, who passed it on to me, Mzila Ulandelwa to pass on to my own son, Vulindela, and now it's gone. Now what to do? I am not the one who killed Jesus Christ and Mbuya Nehanda. Why don't you go to those who are responsible? All I'm saying is that stool was my whole history. And like that, they mourned perished pasts. There were some who appeared speechless, without words, and for a long while, they walked around in silence, like the returning dead. But then with time, they remembered to open their mouths. Their voices came back like tiptoeing thieves in the dark, and this is what they said. They shouldn't have done this to us. No, they shouldn't have. Sali Lueli we fought to liberate this country. Wasn't it like this before independence? 
Do you remember how the whites drove us from our land and put us in those wretched reserves? I was there, you were there. Wasn't it just like this? No, those were evil white people who came to steal our land and make us paupers in our own country. What? But aren't you a pauper now? And these black people evil for bulldozing your home and leaving you with nothing now? You are all wrong. Better a white thief do that to you than your own black brother. Better a wretched white thief. It's the same thing and it isn't. But what's the use? We are here now, here in paradise with nothing. And they had nothing except, of course, memories, their own and those passed down by their mothers and mothers' mothers, a nation's memory. Some appeared with children in their arms. There were many who appeared with children held by the hands. The children themselves appeared baffled. They did not understand what was happening to them. And the parents held their children close to their chests and caressed their dusty, unkempt heads with hardened palms, appearing to console them, but really they did not know what to say. Eventually, the children gave up and ceased asking questions and just appeared empty, almost, like their childhood had fled and left only the bones of its shadow behind. Generally, the men always tried to appear strong. They walked tall, heads upright, arms steady at the sides, and feet firmly planted like trees. Solid Jericho walls of men. But when they went out in the bush to relieve themselves and nobody was looking, they fell apart like crumbling towers and wept with the wretched grief of forgotten concubines. And when they returned to the presence of their women and children and everybody else, they stuck hands deep inside torn pockets until they felt their dry thighs, kicked little stones out of the way, and erected themselves like walls again. But then the women, who knew all the ways of weeping, and all there was to know about falling apart would not be deceived. They rose from the earth, beat dust off their skirts, and planted themselves like rocks in front of their men and children and sheikhs, and only then did all appear almost tolerable. We fast forward to the American section um, my protagonist, darling, is, la um, is lucky or unlucky, depending on how you see it, you, you see it, to leave this paradise and move to the U.S. So one afternoon, she's sitting um, with her aunt Fostalina in Detroit, Michigan, and this is her. There are two homes inside my head. Home before paradise, and home in paradise. Home one and home two. Home one was best, a real house. Father and mother having good jobs, plenty of food to eat, clothes to wear, radios blaring every Saturday, and everybody dancing because there was nothing to do but party and be happy. And then home two, paradise, with his tin, tin, tin. There are three homes inside mothers and Aunt Fostalina's heads. Home before independence, before I was born, when black people and white people were fighting over the country. Home after independence, when black people won the country. And then the home of things falling apart, which made Aunt Fostalina leave and come here. Home one, home two, home three. There are four homes inside Mother of Bones's head. Home before the white people came to steal the country and a king ruled. Home when the white people came to steal the country and then there was war. Home when black people got our stolen country back after independence and then the home of now. Home one, home two, home three, home four. 
When somebody talks about home, you have to listen carefully so you know exactly which one the person is referring to. Two days ago, the president of our country came on TV during the BBC News. He was raising his fists and speaking, saying how our country is a black man's home and would never be a colony again, and what, what. And for Stalina snatched the remote control from the coffee table, pointed it at the TV like it was a gun, and shot. We all turned to look at her, sitting there shaking, her face suddenly ugly like she was chewing some thorns. TK, who is no longer a fat boy because he has started lifting weights and now looks like Will Smith in Ali, started to laugh, but then he stopped himself, maybe because of the look on Anne Fostalina's face. Uncle Kojo grabbed the remote and changed the channel back. Anne Fostalina glared at him for a while, then got up and left the room without saying anything. On TV, the president said, just after Aunt Fostalina left, as if he were telling a secret and he had been waiting for Aunt Fostalina to leave. We don't mind sanctions banning us from Europe. We are not Europeans. And Uncle Kojo threw his fists in the air and pumped them real hard. Then he saluted the TV and shouted, tell them, Mr. President, tell the bloody colonists. Then he was grinning looking first at TK and then at me. That there, boys, is the only motherfucker with balls on our continent, Africa's leading statesman, he said. Me and TK looked at each other, puzzled, and then we smiled, and then we exploded in laughter because it was the first time we heard Angli Kojo using that word, motherfucker, and so it sounded interesting and beautiful. TK was still laughing when he left the living room and went up the stairs. Later, when I got onto Facebook, he had told the story there, and there were so many likes and LOLs on his wall. I'm drinking my third Capri Sun now, and my stomach is so full of guava and liquid it could burst. And for Stalina is busy trying to order her push-up bra, her push-up bra on the phone, and you can hear that she and whoever she is speaking to are having issues. The problem with English is this. You usually can't open your mouth and it comes out just like that. First, you have to think what you want to say. Then you have to find the words. Then you have to carefully arrange those words in your head. Then you have to say the words quietly to yourself to make sure you got them okay. And finally, the last step, which is to say the words out loud and have them sound just right. But then because you have to do all this, when you get to the final step, something strange has happened to you and you speak the way a drunk walks. <laughs> I have decided the best way to deal with it all is to sound American and the TV has taught me just how to do it. It's pretty easy. All you have to do is watch Dora the Explorer, <laughs> The Simpsons, SpongeBob, Scooby-Doo, and then you move on to That's So Raven, Glee, Friends, Golden Girls, and so on, just listening and imitating the accents. If you do it well, then just, then before you know it, Nobody will ask you to repeat what you said. I also have my list of American words that I keep under the tongue like talismans ready to use. Pretty good, for real, awesome, totally, freaking, bizarre, tripping, douchebag, you are welcome, acting up, yikes. The TV has also told me that if I'm talking to someone, I have to look him in the eye even if it is an adult, even if it's rude. I don't know why Aunt Fostalina doesn't think to learn American speech like this, seeing how it would make her life easier so she wouldn't have a hard time like she is right now. I said the angel collection, Aunt Fostalina is saying. She has muted the TV and raised the volume on the handset so I can hear the other person as well. She sounds like a bored young girl. 
I'm sorry, what? I mean, I didn't quite hear that. Maybe it's my line. Angel, angel, angel. And Fostalina says, raising her voice even louder. There is silence, like maybe the girl is getting ready to pray. Angel, and Fostalina adds helpfully, dragging, dragging out the word like she's raking gravel. I silently mouth, angel, angel. I hear the girl make a small sigh. I'm sorry, I don't know what you mean, ma'am, she says finally. You can tell from her voice that she's getting tired from trying to understand. What do you mean you don't know what I mean? You don't understand what I'm saying? Such a simple word, and Fostalina says. She is speaking with her hands and head now, and I can tell from her knotted face that if the girl doesn't get it soon, it's not going to be good. <laughs> I clear my throat to remind Anne Fostalina that I'm in the room, so maybe she will ask me to speak for her, but she doesn't. Now she has scribbled the word angel all over the magazine, and the naked woman with the bra and underwear is all clothed in, the, in black ink, the letters like tiny angry insects. Ma'am, I'm terribly sorry you are having these difficulties, but we have a website that you can order from. The girl on the phone starts, her voice lifting. You can tell that she is pleased with the fact that she has thought of the website, that things are going to work out after all. I am relieved as well, and I start thinking maybe I should run upstairs and grab my MacBook for Aunt Fostalina to use. I get up from the couch. No, I am not ordering online. And Fostalina says, separating her words now, which is never a good sign. I sit back down. She pokes the Victoria's Secret woman's face with a pen as she says it's each word. I am not ordering online. I am speaking in English, so as far as I'm concerned, maybe you can spell it. Now the girl sounds like she's getting annoyed. Now you want me to spell it, and Fostalina says. She looks at me like she can't believe what she is hearing, but I look away at the TV. The woman is gone. There's a new one sitting on an exercise ball. I'm waiting for Aunt Fostalina to tell the girl on the phone off because that's what she sounds like she's getting ready to do but something changes her mind, and she sits up and starts to spell. It's A, Anne Fostalina says. Her voice is a bit calmer. She has written the letter on the magazine as if to be sure. OK, A is in April. No, not April. A is in Annas. It's a different sound. <laughs> N, N as in no. G as in God, E as in it, L as in Libya. There you go, angel, angel, angel. And Fostalina says, there is a brief silence, like maybe the girl is considering what she has written. And then she says, oh, you mean angel? Yes, angel. <laughs> That's what I was trying to tell you all this time. I want a red one. And Fostalina says, rolling her R, the sound of it like something is vibrating inside her mouth, and I promise myself I'll never ever sound like that. When Aunt Fostalina gets off the phone with the Victoria's Secret Lady, she dials a number that must be busy because she quickly hangs up. She immediately dials another, and she has to hold for a little while before I hear her leave a message in our language for the other person to call her back. I know the reason Anne Fostalina is calling is that she needs to tell the Victoria's secret story to someone in our language, because this is what you must do in America whenever something like this happens. You have to tell it to someone who knows what you mean who will understand exactly what you say, and that it is not your fault, but
but the other persons. Someone who knows that English is like a huge iron door and you are always losing the keys. After leaving her message, Aunt Fostalina just sits there as if something important is happening inside her and she is waiting for it to come out, kneel in front of her and announce that it's finished and can it please go attend to other business. She also has this look. I have seen it many times before, but I still don't know whether to call it pain or anger or sadness or whether it has a name. I am careful not to meet her eyes as she puts her card back in her purse and then gets up, walk downstairs to the basement and slams the door shut behind her. I know that she will turn on the lights as she descends the creaking stairway, that she will take small measured steps like there is something down there that she dreads, that when she gets to the bottom, she will stand in front of the mirror that covers one wall and look at her reflection. I know that she won't be looking at her thinness, but at her mouth. I know that she will stand there and start the conversation all over and say out loud in careful English all the things that she meant to say, that she should have said to the girl on the phone, but did not because she could not find the words at the time. I know that in front of that mirror, and for Stalina will be articulate. That English will come alive on her tongue and she will spit it like it's burning her mouth, like it's poison, like it's the only language she has ever known. Thank you. <laughs>